Okay. Well, welcome doc. Oh gosh. Did I, should I call you Dr. Laura, Dr. Just Laura? <laughs> what do I call you? I didn't even think to ask. That's okay. You can call me Laura. That okay. is just fine. Yes. <laughs> you know, I just feel like if you went to all that hard work to become a doctor, maybe I yes. should call you Dr. Laura. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just looked at my calendar and like, you know, like this year, you know, on this day, two years ago, or, you know, whatever. And I just kind of like rolled over the two year anniversary of when I passed my defense okay. and, you know, like became yeah. Dr. Laura. And I am still getting used to that title. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just, I I mean, I, I love it sometimes. Like I have little mugs and stuff that says like, it's doctor actually, but cute. I'm, I'm Laura. <laughs> You're you Laura. Know, like, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yes. Well, I actually, before um, we start, I want to tell you, I found you because, um, my husband and I probably in the last two years have just been having really good conversations about, mm -hmm. we were raised so differently, um, with yeah. our faith background and mm -hmm. we both love Jesus. Um, yeah. but we just have had some really good conversations about like how our yeah. upbringing can really affect our relationship with Jesus and our love yeah. for Jesus and how we love other people. Um, and so he had actually found you, I think on Instagram. And sure. so yeah. probably, I don't know, maybe like three or four months ago, we were talking about just the parallels between, mm -hmm. because I work in the world of trauma and parenting and yes. um, adversity and just the parallels between what we see, um, that is religious hurt and mm -hmm. hurting that happens in the home. And so he was yes. like, oh, you should totally check out this, you know, Dr. Laura that I found. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And literally like right away, I'm like, I have to have her on my podcast. Oh, thank you. I yeah. just, am, I just mm -hmm. love what you do. So I appreciate that. Thank you. All yeah. that to say, I'm thankful that he introduced me yes. to you. <laughs> yes, I am too. I always love hearing like how my account lands in yeah. people's, you yeah. know, in people's laps, because the whole goal and hope is for like education and hopefully yeah. encouragement and, yeah. and finding a sense of hope. And so, um, I really appreciate hearing yeah. all of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Because not everybody knows who you are. Yes. Well, I'll use my official title. My okay. official title is I, I'm Dr. Laura Anderson. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Tennessee. I have a very tiny private practice and the majority of my client work is actually done through coaching. Um, okay. And I am the director and founder of the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery, which is a group of trauma-informed and trauma-entrained practitioners. We Almost all of us have backgrounds in mental health, but have chosen okay. to use the format of coaching because it's a bit more accessible yeah. uh, to a, you know, a variety of different people. You know, it doesn't matter where you live. We wanted to be able to provide for support for people, especially in the realm of like religious trauma, mm -hmm. high control religion, adverse religious experiences. And um, so um, I, I do that. I run that um, and absolutely love it. It's kind of this weird thing that fell into my lap and was like, all right, we need a resource. Let's, let's create mm -hmm. it. Um, it's been such a, such a fun little journey. Um, but yeah, I, I do that. I am um, a soon to be author, yes. a published author. Yeah. Um, I have a book coming out, which I'm really excited about. And that takes all of that takes up a mm -hmm. lot of time. So, you know, in my free time, I hang out with my little dog who's down Aww. here. I'm outside <laughs> as much as possible. And yeah, just, you know, trying to kind of take in, take in nature and walk and enjoy my friends and the life that I've created here in Nashville. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, I am excited for our conversation, but first I need to ask because Nashville is on my bucket list of like places I want to go yeah. someday in my life. <laughs> where, where do I need to go when I come someday? Where do I need to go? Well, it depends, you know, if you're a, if you're a tourist, you know, or a visitor, you go to one set of places and if oh. you're local, you go to another set of places. Interesting. <laughs> so okay. I, I mean, and Nashville, of course, is iconic for like all of its music, right? So yeah. I would encourage anybody who is visiting once, twice, even a handful of times, make sure that you go to Broadway. That, of course, is where, you know, all you just walk up and down the street and you okay. hear music, live music everywhere. It's where you, there's a million bachelorette parties. It's where okay. the Ryman is, all of those oh, things. Oh, okay. I've, yep. 
Yeah. Very close okay. to a lot of different, real, like really cool activities. So I would always encourage people to go there, but then there's also, um, you know, different like pockets or neighborhoods of, mm -hmm. of the town. So anywhere like the Gulch and East Nashville and, uh, Midtown, Midtown is where the locals go. Okay. Um, <laughs> because that it's, it's a bit less crowded. I mean, okay. not on the weekends, but, um, but yeah, it's a bit less crowded, but same great music and kind of vibe. And yeah, Nashville is expanding like crazy. Mm, yeah. Um, so really if you're interested in live music and kind of that whole scene, which is why most people come, yeah. um, Midtown and downtown are going to be the best places to go. Okay. For sure. All right. Oh, I'm hoping to make yes. that happen someday soon. I love but... it. I love it. Yes. Yes. You'll yeah. love it. Everybody okay. has a great time. You know, I can't imagine that I wouldn't have a good time there, but you know, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, talk about religious trauma, shall we? Yes. Let's um, do it. How would you define religious trauma? Yeah. I think this is always the best place to start. And the answer I'm going to give sounds a little cliche, but I'll explain it. Mm -hmm. um, it's religious trauma is trauma. And that's important because we have a lot of really great resources and research modalities, practices, interventions that have been developed over the last, you know, however many decades uh, that work really well for trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I say religious trauma is trauma because that allows us then access to all of this wonderful research intervention and modalities that we can use to work with religious trauma. When we talk about trauma, there isn't some catchy, succinct definition that all yeah. clinicians agree on. Yeah. But the one that I tend to use is that trauma is anything that's too much, too fast, too soon, that overwhelms our ability to cope and come back to a place of safety. Mm. And so that means that trauma is not necessarily like the thing that mm -hmm. happens to you, but it's the way that our nervous system responds, responds. to the thing okay. yeah. that happens to you. So it means that trauma is subjective. What is mm -hmm. traumatic for you may or may not be for me, vice versa. Mm -hmm. Trauma is perceptive, meaning that we, the, the threat doesn't have to like literally be in front of us. It could actually be the perception of threat mm -hmm. that gets our nervous system going to a point where we are overwhelmed. And also trauma is embodied, which means that we don't think it away. It's living in our bodies mm -hmm. in the way res we resolve it through our bodies. I think it's important to understand what trauma is because then when we say what is religious trauma, yeah. we say, okay, well, religious trauma is trauma, but that word religious really yeah. helps us understand. It's almost an adjective that we can use that helps us better understand the context for where the trauma originated from. And that helps us when we're talking about recovery, mm -hmm. that helps us kind of clue us in to some things that we might need to work on. So when I talk about trauma resolution, that's like how the trauma lives in our body. Yeah. That's going to look pretty much the same, regardless of where the trauma originated from. So okay. from childhood, from religion, yeah. from sexualized violence, from war, mm -hmm. how that lives in our body is going to be the same, but the recovery piece is going to look a little bit different. Uh, an, an example I might use is if you're working for a, with like a veteran, a war veteran, yeah. uh, we might be working on things like um, hypervigilance or triggers and fears around, yeah. say, car backfire and loud noises. Sure. Somebody who's coming out of a high control religion or has religious trauma, that's probably not going to be yeah. something that they need to work on. Just like maybe the war veteran isn't going to be triggered or hypervigilant around walking into potentially uh, Hobby Lobby and hearing mm -hmm. some worship music that was perhaps really influential or really mm -hmm. triggering or whatnot that somebody who coming out of a high control religion would. So the recovery piece is a bit more specific to where mm -hmm. the trauma originated from that helps us understand maybe some of the additional things we need to work through. Um, but religious trauma is trauma. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that's one of the things that, it, that my husband and I have really been talking through these last few years is those yeah. parallels. And, mm -hmm. and it's not even necessarily a parallel. It's just, it is, yeah. and yeah. we can't ignore yeah. that and, and say that it's not, or that it's something yeah. different or, yeah. Um, yeah. you, t you talk about adverse religious experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar yeah. with adverse childhood experiences. Yes. And yes. it's another one of those where it's like, okay, th again, another parallel where it makes sense to those of us that understand the world of trauma mm -hmm. to see it mm -hmm. in that way that, yeah, this is all trauma. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about adverse religious experiences, where that came from yeah. and what those yeah. are? 
Yeah. The adverse religious experiences is a, a term that myself and a couple other colleagues coined a few years ago. There is language, you know, that we'd use like say spiritual abuse or religious mm-hmm. abuse. Oftentimes people don't connect to that language. Uh, sometimes that's reserved for what we might consider like really extreme acts of like, say clergy sexual abuse or whatever. Okay. They're like, oh, that's religious abuse. Right. Okay. But you know, these messages that I learned or the, that's not religious abuse. Mm. And so we just wanted to create another term that would also allow for research to expand as well of going like, Hey, um, there might be these experiences that you've had in the context of religion that are adverse or that are impacting you in an Mm -hmm. adverse way. Truly. We took a lot of, um, kind of, um, guidance from the adverse childhood experiences Mm -hmm. with this idea of the, the more or the higher you score, as your ACE score, the more likely it would be that you would have developmental uh, or complex trauma. Sure. Now there's definitely some limitations around the ACE study. We know that now, I mean, there's not yeah. just 10 adverse childhood yeah. experiences, you know, you can have just one and still have trauma. You can have 10 and have zero trauma, right? Yeah. So we know that. And so, you know, part of our hypothesis with um, adverse religious experiences is similar to the ACE study of going, we, we, hypothesize that the more adverse religious experiences you have, the greater the likelihood that it would develop or result in Mm -hmm. trauma. But that's not to say that you couldn't have just one adverse religious experience and that would result in trauma or that you could have a hundred adverse religious experiences and it wouldn't result in trauma. So we're wanting to leave it open. And the other thing that we're wanting to do with that term that differs from the ACE study is we're not looking to necessarily create 10 categories of adversity that you might experience within religion. We're kind Mm -hmm. of leaving that open a little bit. Um, And so right now it's kind of like, Hey, if this was an adverse experience Mm -hmm. for you, it was an adverse experience for you. And we can look at the impact, whether that's mental health diagnoses, trauma, uh, relational, you know, and physiological issues, all sorts of things. Um, but that helps us sometimes give some language to people to kind of help organize and describe what their experiences were. You know, you use the word, um, church hurt and we, Mm -hmm. we hear that a lot. And sometimes people will use that term to almost downplay the Mm -hmm. experiences, right? Oh, you know, you were just hurt inside the church or, you know, you're sinners and sinners are going to hurt other people, but God Mm -hmm. is perfect. And while that might be true, like if that is, you know, part of your spiritual and religious belief that oftentimes can feel shaming or invalidating to people who have truly gone through these experiences and are going, my life was profoundly impacted. There's, I need to learn how to relate to others Mm -hmm. or heal this or that. And so we're just, we're trying to kind of expand the conversation a little bit more with this type of language so that people can accurately describe what's happening to them so that they can get the support and resources that they need. need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you pointing that out because it is more than just hurt. It is more than just being hurt by the church. It's, Mm -hmm. it really does. It sits in our bodies and we hold that and it affects how we are in relationships and yes, with our families and with our kids. And, Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate you pointing that out because it is more than that. Um, Mm -hmm. how, how would somebody know if they have experienced, you know, harm from the church? Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes, okay. First of all, it's going to be different for every single person. I want to like put that out there. So I, I don't have a list of like, it's these symptoms or, Mm -hmm. or whatnot, but I think the more curious we can become about kind of how we're living and relating Mm -hmm. to others in our present day can often be a clue as to either the impact of what happened to us or clue us in as to like, perhaps what happened to us is maybe different than how we've conceptualized it. Sure. So what I mean by that is we go, if we have say an adverse religious experience in a religious context, you know, Mm -hmm. when we're in that, sometimes we don't see it as adverse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we aren't able to, because maybe we are Mm -hmm. so overwhelmed or there's not a place of safety to come back to, or we don't have resources or support. And so we just kind of exist in that Mm -hmm. context and make it through. And then we go, I don't know, weeks, months, years later, you know, we're out of that and we go, wow, that that really did have a profound impact on me. And we might notice that in the way that we relate to others or maybe our hypervigilance or 
the areas where we're triggered, where we go mm-hmm. into a fight or flight or freeze response, the areas where we get really prickly with people, mm-hmm. um, especially kids, right? If they do something and all of a sudden I'm, my expression is more inflated maybe than what the situation before me would yeah. call for. So we look at some of our present day responses and reactions, and that can sometimes clue us into, hey, maybe there's some stuff that we've been going through that isn't fully resolved in our bodies. Um, We might look at triggers, the things that we go, oh gosh, you know, I I tense up when I hear this song or when I Mm -hmm. drive by this building or when I'm in the presence of these people or when I'm thinking back to some of these memories, if we're noticing some of that activation coming up in our mm-hmm. body, that can oftentimes be an indicator, not necessarily that you are traumatized, but that yeah. there is something there. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's important to recognize. Usually it's in the present day when we go, something's not quite right here. Yeah. And perhaps it is connected to something that's happened in the past. Yeah. And that's all very similar to what I tell the parents that I work with is when you're starting to notice those, you know, you being activated or your nervous system is just like hot, you know, Yes, (laughs) like let's pay attention to that because there's probably something there that we don't then want to continue passing on to our kids. Um, Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can Mm -hmm. we talk a little bit about that? Like, yeah. How do we parent in a way that isn't going to keep passing this on to our kids? Yeah. That is such a good question. And I, I actually, I, I don't, um, advertise that I work with like parents, families or whatever, but I do, (laughs) you know, cause I, I call it, I, I don't even, there's a term I have for it and I'm not thinking of it at off the top of my head, but I look at like the way that I work with parents and helping them learn how to regulate their nervous system Mm -hmm. and then invite them to invite their children into that as Mm -hmm. well. It completely shifts the way that they parent. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do work with adults exclusively and, and that is one of their biggest questions is, how do I make sure that everything that I've learned or everything that I've endured, everything that I'm coming out of isn't passed on in a way that's harming my children. And the first thing I always tell them is like, there's no such thing as a perfect parent, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Studies studies would say that we only need to quote unquote, get it right as a parent about 30% of the time. And then the other 70% is all about repairing well. Mm -hmm. And so I always like to start with that because I think it's so important that parents have such a big job and Mm -hmm. such an important job, right. To raise up these tiny humans and send them out into the world. And that is, I mean, it takes a brave person. It takes a strong person (laughs) and it takes a humble person, right? Mm -hmm. Because children are going to trigger us. They're going to bring up all the stuff that we thought we could hide. (laughs) And it's going to be right there in our face. And especially when we're coming out of systems that are high control, that have dynamics of power and control in them, we start to see firsthand like, oh, this is where, this is where those messages are still living and Mm -hmm. popping up in, in my body. And so, you know, I always think like the more that we can work on ourselves, like as an adult or as a parent, Mm. um, we then just give that to our children naturally. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, like I said, I watch my client, I I'm thinking of a particular client where she has worked so hard on learning to expand her window of tolerance and Mm -hmm. learning to regulate herself and understand what's going on inside her. And then she just naturally transitioned that to her kids. And so when her kids would get activated, she would sit with them and, and co-regulate with them. Mm -hmm. Um, when she's, when she has emotions or they have emotions, they just allow themselves to feel it in a safe and contained way without it becoming a temper tantrum or one upping each other of who can have the bigger emotion or whatnot. And I like, I regularly sit back in awe and I'm like, you are giving your kids such a gift by showing up as a human and doing your own work and showing them like, Hey, like (laughs) I'm in this with you, you know, we're going through this together. And so I think there's something really beautiful about giving yourself permission as a parent to also be a human, Mm -hmm. to know that you're going to make mistakes, to know that it's going to be really hard. I mean, I'm I'm sure you can speak to this as well of like, you know, sometimes when our kids are certain ages that were tender for us, you know, when we were Mm -hmm. that age, it can be really hard to parent in a way that feels um, connecting 
or yeah. a way that feels affirming. And yet when we can be aware of that as a parent and understand what's going on and commit to taking care of ourselves so that our kids don't have to take care of us yep. and then ex- extend that back to our kids, that is something probably that was not modeled for us, yeah. but something that can be a true gift for the children and, and passing that on to additional generations. I know that's maybe not all the specifics to answering the question that you asked, but it, that that's just kind of where my mind went at first. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think that that just shows still that like trauma is trauma. And because those, that is everything we would do, whether you were dealing with a family that's, um, yes, you know, adopted a child who has experienced trauma or a Mm -hmm. parent who has experienced, you know, some, you know, childhood trauma themselves, whatever it is, we have to be aware of our own stuff and our own healing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so let's kind of go back to religious trauma in the sense Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, a caregiver who is maybe realizing that Mm -hmm. this is how they were raised. Their kids are already in the picture (laughs) and Mm -hmm. like, how do we kind of pull that back a little to do better for our kids if we're already in it? Yeah. That makes sense. And I mean, there's, yeah, I think so. There's, I think there's many people that are in that scenario yeah. where, you know, they're in their thirties, forties, they've mm-hmm. got kids who are, you know, 10, 15 years old and they're going, oh, wow. The way mm-hmm. that I've raised my children for X amount of years, not really fitting with that anymore. And you know, sometimes it depends on the age of the kid um, and the relationship that you've developed with them already, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go back and have conversations with them and Mm -hmm. say, hey, this is where we've been as a family. I'm starting to ask questions. I'm starting to realize this is the impact. I'm starting to make these changes. I want to let you in on that. I want to tell you I'm I'm trying to do something different. I'm trying to respond differently. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm Mm -hmm. going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to not get it right. I want to invite you into that process. Mm -hmm. So I think, especially with older kids, you know, Mm -hmm. probably over the age of 10, 11, that can be a really nice approach to take because there likely is going to be some confusion on their part too. Maybe they've been in that same religious context for 10, 12 years. And so they have learned all of this and it could be very confusing to say like, why, why are my parents all of a sudden doing or believing or talking differently Mm -hmm. than what we've been, we've been taught. I think there's also something really valuable uh, as a parent to be able to give your children then space to ask questions Mm -hmm. and to challenge and to also believe what they're going to believe, right. Mm -hmm. To say like, Hey, yeah, my kid is 15 years old. Um, and I'm kind of moving in this direction and they're moving further into some of those beliefs. How can I create a space that allows them to have choice and autonomy Mm -hmm. and, um, be able to have conversations and not, um, force them to ask these same questions that I'm asking or to believe in this other way. I think Mm -hmm. that can be really important. I think sometimes with younger kids, it can be a little bit easier just Mm -hmm. because they may not be as like personally invested Mm -hmm. sometimes in the religious pieces or church activities, just given their age and maturity and, and how they can conceptualize things. But I think especially the older that we go, inviting them into that process, inviting them to ask questions And also, and maybe this is for me, like, um, I always appreciate when parents come back and offer apologies to their children for perhaps the ways that they acted or spoke or reacted that they're no, that no longer fit with who they are and to try to make amends and to say, you know, I am so sorry. Like I, I was doing the best that I could and I realized that was really actually quite harmful, or maybe that was sure. really confusing and giving a child an opportunity to say like, yeah, actually that was, yeah. and we do need to repair this relationship. There's something really like at, as a daughter, yeah. <laughs> like myself, right. Like as an adult daughter, I, I hear that and I'm like, wow, that to me is, is such a strong mm-hmm. caring parent who can do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that invitational piece and, and And then respecting your children too, Mm -hmm. to say like, they get to feel certain ways about this. They Mm -hmm. get to ask questions. They get to, um, be frustrated or be sad. You know, I can think of, I I can think of a a girlfriend of mine who has daughters who they left the church and 
you know, the, the oldest daughter, like left good friends Mm -hmm. and left, you know, like a youth group and all these things. And part of that process was allowing her daughter to grieve and allowing her daughter to be angry that she no longer got to see these friends and, and whatnot. I think all of that is so important. It gives opportunities for new ways to interact with your children. That may be different than how you did if you were in a high control religion. And there, since there is so much rigidity and prescription around how to parent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think about too, because, um, you know, I have listeners that are from all walks of life. And so, you know, for the, for the listeners who are in, and they probably aren't aware that they're in a high control religion. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I would. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, but for any parent who is faced with their kiddos, maybe trying to, um, find their own way and develop their own faith and figure out what they believe. So no matter what we believe as parents, Mm -hmm. how, what advice would you give for raising kids to be able to figure their own stuff out? I would say, teach your kids how to think, not Mm -hmm. what to think. Okay. Let them be curious. Let them ask questions. Let them have the big question mark answer. I don't know. Let them not have to figure it out. Let them try things, right? Like even I, that can be so hard, especially if you're raising your children differently than how you are raised, right? Like the, the tendency to want to go back to like, what Mm -hmm. is familiar is so human. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so to be like, Oh, I gotta, I've got to take care of myself so I can let my child um, try this different thing. You know, our job Mm -hmm. as a parent is to create a safe and stable base for the kids to make mistakes, Mm -hmm. but then be picked back up to have a moment of reaction, but then learn how to regulate with a parent and then regulate themselves. When we can create that, it creates adults who then can provide that to other people. And so giving, like teaching your kids, some of these tools where, you know, in high control religion, there isn't a lot of allowance for critical thinking. Mm -hmm. There's not allowance for options, for making mistakes, for, um, asking questions, believing different things, Mm -hmm. having doubts, leaning into the doubt and, and allowing yourself to sit there in some of that gray space. Like those are things that are not necessarily natural to high control religion. So for coming out of these spaces, some of the same things that you're doing as an adult of like teaching yourself how to think and, you know, exploring different things are the same things that we can allow our kids to do, maybe even do it all together. Right. Yeah. But giving them these opportunities to provide like a safety of going like, let's critically think through this. Let's, Mm -hmm. let's figure out, well, why, why do we think that? What are all the other options and do it in a safe way with you there present. Mm -hmm. So you can be teaching them and modeling to them. How do we do this? So that when they're with their friends, when they're at in their classes, when they're, you know, wherever they're at, they go, Oh, I, I know how to do this. Like, this is something that I've been taught and that's not something that's necessarily taught in high control religion, but it's such a gift that we can then give our kids. If we're coming Mm -hmm. out of that to say like, Hey, we're like, we want to ask questions. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other piece of it too, is like offering love and acceptance, regardless of where your children land. Right. So it may be that they land very close to where you're landing. It may be that they're at the other end of the spectrum. What are the ways that we can connect to and find support and love with one another that has nothing to do with the labels, with the beliefs, like, how do I love you as a human? Um, And that's not going to change. You could believe this or that, or this other thing over here. And you're still my child and I'm, I'm still your parent and I love you regardless. Uh, I think that's so important because also in high control religions, love can be so conditional based Mm -hmm. off of what you believe or how you practice or how Mm -hmm. you live. So modeling like, yeah, I might not understand what you believe, but I love you. That's huge. Yeah. That's, that's that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we are coming to the end of our time, but there's a few more things I want to talk about. Yeah. And so I'm gonna, so just a couple more things. I am loving this conversation mm, um, and I can't wait yeah. to get your book. And so can you tell Thank us you. about your book? Yeah. So my book is called when religion hurts you healing from religious trauma and the impact of high control religion. I took, uh, it's kind of a 
conglomeration of my own personal experience, my doctoral research and my clinical uh, experience as a therapist. Okay. Um, and, and really we're looking at, it's, it's not prescriptive. It is not like, here's what you need to do to heal from sure. religious trauma. I do spend a lot of time kind of um, educating on what is trauma, what is the okay. nervous system, you know, some of those things. And then I look at like, um, I, I, really my doctoral research is about expanding the definition of healing. A lot of times we think of okay. healing as this linear practice, right? Mm -hmm. You do these things, then you get to the period at the end of the sentence, yeah. I'm and done. Healed. We're done right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's not really yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I looked at expanding that and looking at themes of people living in healing bodies after trauma. So okay. what, what is the day-to-day -day life? What's it like to live in a body healing from trauma? And so we're looking at things like stabilizing your nervous system, reclaiming pleasure and sexuality, mm -hmm. developing a robust spectrum of emotions, um, having connective and healthy relationships. And so I take each one of these themes and talk about how religion and high control religion impacts those, like mm -hmm. kind of the damage that it can do and what it would look like to live as a healing person, mm -hmm. which means you don't have to have it all figured out. We're looking for the teeny tiny moments of a different choice. Mm. or a different coping mechanism, right? Uh, or here's the things that you might start to see in your life as you're healing from religious trauma. Oh, yeah. uh, and so that's kind of the direction that I went with that. And there's, there's some practices in there. I didn't okay. want it to be like a book filled with like therapeutic practices. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be a workbook someday okay. uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, you know, I did put some practices just to help us understand like, Hey, uh, for instance, um, you know, high control religion teaches about boundaries. I'm going to put quotes around that, yeah, which yeah. is really just a set of rules. Do this and don't do this, right? Sure. Here's what's good and bad, right and wrong. Okay. Not okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas I would say boundaries is actually far more expansive than that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's fluid and it's, you know, like depending on where we're at as a healing individual, our boundaries might be more rigid or more flexible. Yeah. So I talk about this shift from this set of rules into this more fluid place. And I might give an activity of like, Hey, if we viewed boundaries like this, what is it that you need to feel safe? Let's start to identify that. Yeah. And how would that look in our lives? Well, so good. I'm trying to make it really practical. Mm -hmm. Um, not as a prescription, like, okay, you need to work on your boundaries. You need to work on your relationships, but just mm -hmm. saying like, Hey, Oh gosh, I am healing. Like mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get to this period at the end of the sentence. Yeah. I can already be like really, um, grateful for the, the things that are shifting in my life and hopefully celebrate those. Yeah. Um, I believe healing is all about living, like being present. Mm -hmm. And if we're constantly searching for like, I have to get to this point and then I'm healed, we're missing the present moment. Mm -hmm. So if we can view healing as these little things that are happening every moment of every day, it gives us motivation, encouragement to continue moving forward yeah. um, and to not be defined by the things that happen to us. Yeah, sure. Well, so, okay. So when, sorry, I just like, we can have okay. more conversation because <laughs> yes, it's just, yeah. I'm loving this, but okay. Yeah. So when is your book coming out? I have already pre-ordered yes. it. So I'm so oh, excited, but I, I can't remember when. Yes. When. It's uh, coming out October 17th. Okay. So pre pre-orders are available uh, wherever you buy your books, whether that's online uh, through my publisher or publisher, or you can go to your local bookstores and request it. Um, I think it usually works like they can get any book, but like yeah. the more it's requested, the more likely that they'll actually like keep it in stock, but a big fan of local uh, bookstores to totally. support yeah. if you can, Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. but also it's available at any other place that you would purchase books. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So two more questions. Yeah. What do you wish more people thought about when it comes to trauma? Oh, I wish that people would think about um, the all encompassing and slow nature of healing, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is way, that's a big sentence unto itself, right? I think that, um, you know, I, I'm a big, I work a lot with the nervous system, uh, which okay. is maybe a, a different conversation, but I always say like, when we go at the pace of the nervous system, which is usually much slower than we would like, yeah. then we end up being able to go faster in the end. And I mm -hmm. think so many people uh, in for good reasons, get to this work and they're like, let's go, whatever yeah. it takes, let's yep. just jump in. 
And I can appreciate that motivation. I resonate with that motivation. Mm -hmm. That is how I was too. And I know for myself and I know for so many of my clients, we end up doing so much damage Mm -hmm. by kind of like cannonballing into a pool that we don't know how to swim in. Yeah. And so if I could like, like let everybody know, like this is sometimes painfully slow work at first. Yeah. But when you allow yourself to go slower, you get to go faster. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to give yourself so much patience and compassion with that Mm -hmm. uh, trauma is like impacts us on a multidimensional level, right? So healing is going to happen multidimensionally also, which means that there's a lot that Mm -hmm. we're going to be navigating through. And it just, it takes time. Uh, I don't believe that time heals all wounds, but I do believe we need time to get our nervous system back into a space of feeling um, more regulated and uh, a bit more like accessible. And then we can we can go from there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, okay. So what would be three things you would recommend to someone who, um, not necessarily specifically to religious trauma, just trauma in general, um, which we've already talked about is trauma is trauma, but what would be three resources that you would recommend to someone who is realizing that they've got Mm. some healing to do? Yeah. So I'll give you some really practical resources. I really, really love the work of Peter Levine, who is the creator of Somatic Experiencing. He has some really accessible books out there. I would recommend anybody starting with the book called Healing Trauma. Um, It's a very tiny book. So, I mean, it's like little tiny in size, but Mm -hmm. it's skinny. Uh, Like, And um, what I love about it is he does such a really great job of mixing education with Mm -hmm. practice. Um, and so there's some really practical steps for like starting to get into your body and experience internal safety. Um, and it can lay a really nice foundation along with that. I really like Irene Lyon, um, who has a YouTube channel that is filled with free resources. Okay. So the resources I'm recommending are like low or no cost, because I think that's so important to have, um, different like access points for Mm -hmm. people, because I know not everybody can afford therapy or coaching, or they don't have Mm -hmm. access to it or they're not ready. And that's okay. That is totally okay. Um, so I would say Peter Levine, um, I would say Irene Lyon, and then, um, let's see another accessible resource. And there's so many books that I'm like thinking, I know, of. right. <laughs> um, <laughs> like this book and this book and yeah. this book. If you want a little bit more of a comprehensive book where you're looking kind of like A to Z, like what is trauma resolution? I would go with a book by a woman named Kimberly Ann Johnson, okay. and it is called call of the wild. Okay. Now she does gear it a bit more towards women. However, if you can overlook her use of the word, you know, female or woman or whatnot, Mm -hmm. and just substitute it for, you know, a neutral pronoun, I think it is accessible for anybody of any gender, any walk of life. And she does a really good job of kind of helping you develop skills and resources within yourself Mm -hmm. and helping you navigate all the way through the trauma resolution process. Okay. Um, and it's a very kind of safe, slow way to do it, but very powerful. Okay. So, um, I would recommend her as well. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I will include all of that in the show notes so everybody yep. can find yes. it easily. Um, yes. and yeah, I just, yeah. and also I'll make sure that I link where they can pre-order the book. Yes. Thank um, you. So I'll put it, and, put that in there too. Yeah. I would, what if I, can, if it's yeah, okay, um, absolutely. as a resource, I would love to like, just let people know too, of, um, I run an online coaching company called yeah. the center for trauma resolution and recovery. Okay. And the reason I just mentioned it is because I, I said, you know, not everybody can afford coaching and, and therapy and that's true. Mm-hmm. And, but if that is something that you're interested in, we offer individual couples, family, and group coaching, we are starting to roll out within, by the end of this calendar year, different courses and seminars um, and different resources like workbooks and things like that. Again, we're trying to hit a bunch of different price Mm -hmm. points so that people can, um, yeah, just have access to resources. Mm -hmm. When we're talking religious trauma specifically, there's just not a lot of like specific resources for religious trauma. Mm -hmm. So even though I would say religious trauma is trauma and any of those resources that I mentioned previously would be 
helpful and yeah. have been helpful. I know for me personally, for many of my clients, th- one of the things we do focus on at the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery is the specific religious trauma piece, you know, healing from cults, from dynamics of power yeah. and control, adverse religious experiences, purity culture. And oh, so yeah. all of our practitioners um, are trauma trained, uh-huh. like they help people resolve trauma. They all have personal backgrounds in high control religion. They all have professional backgrounds in men- various mental health fields and are really passionate about helping people who are coming out of these systems who mm-hmm. need some extra support. Um, so I always, I always have to like plug that oh, too for sure. because, um, it is, it's, it's just, been really amazing to be a part of. And, um, I feel like really honored to, to, to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. And there's virtual options. It is exclusively virtual. Okay. So we actually have, we have clients from all over the world, which is just incredible. Um, and so I I would say the majority of our clients are from the United States, but Mm -hmm. we have clients who are ex Hindu, ex Muslim, mm. you know, that are living in, you know, overseas mm. wow. and in various countries. Mm-hmm. And it's just been like, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, like we got a call from Australia the other day. Yeah. And it's like, that's incredible. I just, right. I love, that's why we chose to do coaching because of the accessibility sure. piece. Yep. So it is all exclusively online. I have okay. one practitioner who has an office here in Nashville. So if you live in Nashville, you can go okay. to her office, <laughs> but everybody else is online. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I will make sure I include all of that too. So thank you. Everybody can that. find you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am so thankful for our time together and all yeah. of your wisdom. I, like I said, I, I kept having to stop myself because I was like, I want to ask you more, <laughs> but nope, we got to okay. stay on track here. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, yeah. Well, anyway. I'm really appreciative of you having me. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm happy to come back anytime. This is this oh, great work that you, you do. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Thanks.